Why is this calamity come upon us? It is from the true and living God. He has brought this storm because of me. Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? I am a Hebrew, and I fear Jehovah, the God of the heavens, the one who made the sea and the dry land. I am. I was his prophet. What have you done? He told me to go to Nineveh and deliver a message. Instead, I ran away. What must we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? What must we do? Lift me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will calm down for you. For I know that it's because of me that this violent storm has come upon you. All right, folks, you are listening to the Yishai Fleischer yeah! Show, and we are live here on Facebook, uh, on, on um, Periscope, on YouTube, and we are talking about the things that matter so much to us, and that is... Uh, let me see. How come I seem I see I sense that we're frozen? Why are we frozen? Let's start that again. Hello, you're frozen. I'm not frozen. Oh, look at that. All right, we're gonna have to start again. Yehuda, I feel I feel frozen. How could this be? <laughs> Hold on one second, folks. This is a an unusual occurrence. Yehuda, you hear me? I hear you. Oh wow! Hold on one second. Looks like we are really having a frozen moment. I never had that before. Did you pause the video? Maybe the video paused you. Oh. Yehuda, are you there? Hey. All right, let's start again. Shalom, everybody. You are watching the Yishai Fleischer Show and listening on the Land of Israel Network. We're broadcasting live on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope. We had some te technical difficulties, but we are back. We are joined today by our beloved, a uh, long time have not, has not been here, one of our beloved guests, Rabbi Yehuda Cohen, who is one of the leaders of the vision movement, uh, which seeks to identify and achieve the next uh, the next challenges and the next steps of Jewish history. He lives in northern Judea and lectures at the English department of Mechon Meir. Rabbi Yehuda, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. And um, we started the show with a little bit of a uh, vision um, of Jonah the whale. Jonah, yeah, where, did, where did you find that? Where did you find you know, that video? I, yeah, there's, there's good stuff on YouTube. And I just typed in Jonah and the whale and I saw this one and I thought you might like it because it's mm -hmm. edgy. Right, and there, there was some edgy stuff there, and um, I don't know who made that movie, but uh, but we re really saw this tough moment where where Jonah, Yona, let's call him Yona from here on, is uh, on the boat, and and when the boat is is in deep trouble, the captain of the boat has to come down and wake him up because he's asleep at the bottom of the boat, and um, it says it says in in the book of Yona, uh, verse five. Um, Yona went into the belly of the ship, into the down part of the ship. He lay down and he fell asleep. But the captain of the ship came to him. And he said to him, 
Malachan nirdam. Why are you? What, what are you doing sleeping? Hey, sleepyhead. Kum, get up. Cry lelokecha. Call out to your God. Ulai tasheta elohim. Maybe God will answer you. Itasheta elohim lano. He'll answer us. Velo noved. We won't be lost. A lot of times, I think of that captain as actually God Himself uh, showing up to Yona and saying, "Hey, sleepyhead. Like, like, like. What do you? What do you just? Uh, what do you so?" What he's so forgetful about? There's, there's, there's something to do here, and you can get up and pray. And that's actually one of the reasons why I have you on the show today because I feel like you're one of the people who don't fall asleep and, and, and are part of a, a, a real consciousness that there's so much to do at this moment. Uh, and well, there really is. There really is, well, right? Sure. We, I mean, it's very empowering to, to be honest to, to live in such an incredible generation in such an incredible chapter of history where there really is so much to do and really so many ways that we could play meaningful roles in advancing our people's story and, and humanity's story. That, that's a really empowering feeling. And I think it just, to put it in your words, it's hard to fall asleep. It's, it's hard to sleep when there's so much to do. And yet when I woke up this morning, Yehuda, mm -hmm. and I looked on my Google News my mm -hmm. Twitter feed, and my WhatsApps, uh, I saw a lot of depression. I saw a lot of people uh, upset with um, the debates yesterday in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the coronavirus raging in Israel. And my wife just you know, again pointed out to me that where we were one of the world leaders in terms of avoiding coronavirus, we are now one of the world leaders in, in actually getting sick. How do you think that happened? How do you think we, we made that transition from being a world leader in fighting the virus to really being an example, uh, like a cautionary tale? Which, which, uh, which wavelength should we, should we access in order to answer uh. that question? Should we, should we you know, access the, the, the Hashem, the God uh, channel, or should we access the science channel? Or can, let, we, can let, we access Let's both start with Pshat. Pshat. Pshat level, we went back to – first thing, Jewish people are social people, and so mm -hmm. social distancing is just hard for us. Mm -hmm. um, we've got this disease, and the minute we went back to school, the, win the minute the kids went back to school, boom, uh, it, just, it just shot up, and, and it spread throughout society, and society was tired of the last lockdown, and they just weren't careful enough, and it, and it just spread. And at the end, the answer is also it's a disease. It spreads. Like we can do a lot of self-blame. Or we can accept the fact that there's a sickness out there, and it and it get it gets us. Mm -hmm. That's on that channel. On the God channel, uh, maybe we were a little, maybe we had a little bit. Uh, we have a Jewish problem, which is hubris, right? We sometimes, you know, think that you know we got it going on, and we're we're on top of the world. So God wants to bring us down a notch or two sometimes. So He sends it. Uh, you know, He sent it before a second time. He came in, and it it came a little bit harder. And maybe instead of being the uh, you know the uh, Show show offs of the world. We're now, you know, a bit of the uh, uh, on on the on the bottom of that story. What do you think? Mm -hmm. You know what? I'll, I'll be honest. I don't think too much about it. You know, I live on a mountain where uh, I don't interact with so many people anyway, aside from my immediate family, like in person. Like I haven't been teaching recently. Obviously, since this new lockdown, I haven't been going into Jerusalem to teach. Uh, most of our programs, you know, the Vision Movement, have been moved online. You know, in webinars, you know, we, we have a magazine, of course, visionmag.org, where we continue to put out content and, you know, my podcast, The Next Stage, that continues to work. But all of that is really separated from other human beings. Like that can all be done, as you know, via, you know, uh, platforms like this one, where you're, you're speaking to people over a computer. So um, I obviously, you know, I, I do come from the perspective that the Kadosh Baruch Hu, like the uh, author of history is doing this and it has significance. It's part of this chapter we're living in. It's part of this uh, era. You know, people are going to remember the, the coronavirus as playing a role in changing the world. And we really are living in a, a very transitional period, I think, in, in global events. And I think the, the COVID-19 virus has, has played a role. In terms of politics here, uh, I think it's really challenged Netanyahu uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who otherwise, uh, you know, he, he's had, you know, legal troubles, of course, indictments, etc. But he, he was really able to weather the political storm and even, you know, p pull a few rabbits out of a hat in terms of these, you know, regional peace deals, you know, regardless of what you think of them. And maybe we can talk about those later. Uh, 
but but I think that this coronavirus is something that it, it doesn't seem to be something he's developed a strong opinion on. And now, just like I'm guilty of that as well, the difference is I'm not the prime minister of the country. I'm not responsible for everybody's you know health and safety. So it's okay for me not to develop a strong position on on how to. Uh, you know how to approach COVID-19, but when you're the Prime Minister of Israel, I think you have to have a very set policy, and you have to uh, have conviction, you know, and persistence. And I think the real winner politically in all this has been Naftali Bennett, because Naftali Bennett is perceived by the public as having a very clear, um, very clear uh, position, you know, a very clear outline for how Israel can beat this. And he appears to be, again, now from the opposition, he appears to be somebody who can implement and like carry the country through this. And therefore he's soaring in the polls. Of course, during his brief stint as defense minister, he, he got to tackle the coronavirus, you know, personally uh, at a time when we did well. So I think that uh, this has shaken up our political system. I think it's shaken up the, certainly the American political system, the global political system. And, uh, we're going to see a lot of changes. And, and I think even the way we interact, you know, even the way we work, I think when Corona is over, people are still going to be working from home. You know, offices are closing down, businesses are being destroyed, but some businesses are figuring out that we don't need everybody coming to an office. Some people are figuring out that, you know, we can uh, be more productive if we don't uh, waste time on travel. And there might be a social cost to pay for this. I mean, we might end up living in a very different world where human beings interact a lot less, but it appears at the moment that the coronavirus is taking us to a different place. So uh, you mentioned the Kadosh Baruch Hu, which is, of course, uh, God mm -hmm. Almighty, the, uh, the Holy One, blessed be He. And I just want to remind you from time to time to, to translate into English because we have people from all over the world, mm -hmm. like Erica, who says Shalom from Sweden. Have a blessed mm -hmm. and joyous Sukkot Sameach. Notice nice. that she used the, the word joy twice there, joyous and samach, uh -huh. which is important. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, we got uh, Birch Griffin saying, please repent while you still are healthy enough to do so. All right. That's a good idea. And you're absolutely right. We have to take it seriously. Uh, Louise says, hi, Yishai. Hi, Louise. How are you? Um, we have Stephen watching in Northern in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. I always value your contributions. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. It's good to hear from you all the way from Northern Ireland, a place that maybe maybe has a thing or two to teach the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jacob is watching from Bahrain. He says, I'm an Indian. Praise the Lord. That is beautiful language. And my friend from Cyprus says shalom as well. So uh, one of the things that I love about this platform is the ability to really uh, connect and see people from all over the world. When you guys write uh, a little message on my board here, it's not only that I'm broadcasting to you, you're broadcasting back. And just this feeling that 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 the light of Israel can broadcast to the world is very much, I think, uh, also part of what what this this move towards the internet uh, through because of COVID, less physical socializing, like you were saying, but more this internet socializing. But that also means that we're really connecting globally, which is really maybe part of the great vision of Israel being a country that has light to the nations, more light to the nations. Uh, you and I had really a, a discussion before the show today about, you know, and this ties into what we were talking about COVID, which is Israel leading. Like, how does Israel really lead or what's the vision of, of Israel leading uh, um, in terms of the world, in terms of leadership in the world? Uh, by the way, and speaking of that, just uh, Hans says, Shalom from Indonesia. All right. So we got people really from all over the world. And, and so... So people are tuning into our show, which really is trying to to share the light of Israel. What is what mm -hmm. is uh, the light of Israel? Now, what, one of my contentions uh, during our discussion before the show was that Israel doesn't always lead necessarily from a position of leadership per mm -hmm. se, but sometimes as uh, a role of um, inspirer, in advisor, mm -hmm. uh, cultural. Um, uh, uh, you know, like not necessarily through a position of I am the number one chief top dog. Uh, I may be not the top dog, but I am I am there sending a contribution that shapes the way the world goes uh, and not necessarily being, you know, the world's number one country in, in other terms. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you mentioned this famous phrase that we're supposed to be a mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh, a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation and a holy convocation. That's what they say, holy nation. Um, and so that to me actually speaks of not necessarily uh, political or economic leadership, but but a role as like a priest to the world, uh, mm -hmm. which which kind of shares uh, light and the light of Hashem. And that is coming out more in our time, I think, than ever before. What do you think? Okay. Uh, well, I think a lot on what you just said, and I'm not sure that advisor and inspirer are necessarily the same roles. I think inspirer is definitely one of our roles. Uh, I would put it like this. Uh, like what's every... a prophet to a king? Like, okay. like, like, a, like a prophet to a king is maybe what Israel to the nations is. Okay, there are a lot of metaphors we could use. Um, I think the metaphor I'd like to use, at least for right now, is that of an orchestra. Right now, I would say the world is a cacophony. Every musical instrument, you know, every nation, every culture, every ideology, every political position is arguing with one another and trying to achieve dominance at the expense of the other. And Israel is not an instrument. Israel was created to be the conductor because our unique contribution is Nivua. That's what we have. Like we, we have prophecy to give to the world and not for our sake, but for the sake of the world. Remember that our ancestor Avraham was meant to become a great nation for the sake of humanity, not for the sake of his descendants. You know, and, and by the way, I think we see this friction throughout the story of Avraham. You know, we're going to welcome him, Bezrat Hashem, on the first night of Sukkot. We're going to be welcoming Avraham as one of the Ushpizin, as one of our honored guests on the first night of Sukkot. And I think it's it's important to really look at this character of Avraham as the first of our patriarchs, somebody who had a very universal mission, a very universal mission, um, but continued to be told by his wife, by his God, that that mission has to be achieved through a very specific line of descendants, which was very counterintuitive for him. Remember, Avraham is living at a time, I mean, I think he got it intellectually, he understood he's going to have kids and he's going to have grandkids and he's going to have great grandkids and eventually this will be a great nation and the whole world will be blessed through this nation. But practically speaking, remember, his, his son Yitzchak is born when he's 100 years old. What's practically happening, his day-to-day -day life, his day-to-day -day mission is basically traveling preacher, you know, spiritual leader, occasionally warrior. Like, you know, he does lead a war against the four most powerful kings of his time. But he's looking at civilizations like Babylon and, and Egypt, who were very dominant civilizations at the time. And, and, and even Grar, by the way, you know, even the, this, you know, um, on Rosh Hashanah, we we saw the Torah portion of uh, where the king of Gerar, Avimelech, the, the Philistine king of Gerar, comes to Avraham and essentially makes a deal with him that many of our sages criticize Avraham for, this kind of almost like a land for peace deal that Avraham will allow the Philistines to have political control over parts of the land of Israel for X number of generations. But Avraham would have a role in that kingdom. Avraham would be the spiritual leader. Avram would be the minister of religion, so to speak. Uh, and that's, I think, the way Avraham saw himself at that time. As minister, trying to... minister of inspiration. Right. And, and even, even taking, you know, e even... Chief inspiration he... officer. Right. E even taking Hagar, the princess of Egypt, uh, you know, uh, eventually as, as a wife. You know, the idea was that he has the... He has the knowledge of what the world is supposed to be. He's the spiritual leader, the inspirer, you know, the, the moral shepherd, so to speak. But he's not really, in, 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 with the exception of the situations where he's forced into it, he is not really creating societies, building cities, going to war, leading armies. Th these aren't the things he's concerned with. He's concerned with spreading his message and trying to find the most powerful vehicles, meaning the political formations that already exist, the kingdoms that already exist in his day to help him spread that message. Like that's really where Avram's at. Um, I mean, he he's told over and over and over again, no, it's going to happen this way. You have to go to a specific land. Remember his brother, Nahor, they were on the same mission. They're both Hebrews. They both have this mission of uniting humanity um, with the knowledge of Hashem's oneness, with it, with the knowledge that all of us are really part of an organic whole, all of, all of us, all of humanity, all of creation is really part of this ultimate timeless reality without end that creates all and sustains all and empowers all and loves all. And, uh, and, and Nimrod, of course, 
had his own approach to trying to unite humanity. It was it was against that knowledge, but rather behind like technology and rather behind like uh, you know like the brick the 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 brick in in the Tanakh is kind of like a symbol for technology that uh, that Nimrod is trying to unite the world behind what we can create, what we can do, as opposed to this like greater power that's that's that we're actually a part of. But Nahor, the brother of Avraham, tries to achieve this mission of spreading this idea by going to the cosmopolitan center of the world, going to uh, go, going to uh, Haran and uh, and basically, uh, trying to spread this message, but it, almost what we'll call Galut Lishma, very similar to Rabbi Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, you know, in Germany, this idea of you go to the cultural centers of the world, maybe you can put Yeshiva University in this category, trying to influence the world that way. But after a couple generations, you see Bituel and Levan are not Hebrews anymore. They're not Ivrim, they're Aramim, they're Arameans. Whereas Avraham was told he had to go, or Avraham was told he had to go to a very specific geographic location, a very specific territory that his family is actually from, that Terach wanted to return to, and there create a specific nation. He knows this, but he doesn't feel it in his day to day. In his day to day, he's a traveling preacher. His top student is Eliezer. It might make sense to him practically that Eliezer might be his successor, maybe Yishmael, you know, Yishmael being the product of his union with the princess of Egypt. Um, but it, it's really this constant uh, correcting we see from the Kadosh Baruch Hu, from, from the uh, Holy One, from the author of history, the creator of the world, and from his wife, Sarah, who we say had even greater nevuah, greater prophecy than Avraham, that he's told it has to come through a nation, this Mamlechet Koanim, the Goy Kadosh, you mentioned, this, this holy nation that has to function, though, not as a, uh, a spiritual being detached from the world and detached from life. The you know you said mamlechet koanim, the kingdom of priests, the goy kadosh, and holy nation. When I think of a kadosh from from a Hebrew perspective, from a Torah perspective, when we talk about a kadosh, a kadosh is not somebody who separates himself from politics. Is not somebody who separates himself from sexual relations. Is not somebody who separates himself from uh, business or or economic issues. The Kadosh is somebody who's fully in the world and bringing the world to what it's supposed to be. And ultimately, that means that Israel does have to become a leader on the world stage, also culturally, also politically, also economically. We have to set an example that, like you said, will inspire the world. I think advisor was, was a role that a lot of Jews took upon ourselves in exile when, when we were conditioned, especially in Europe but other places as well. I think Jews in exile were conditioned to see our survival, to see our well-being as being very much dependent on our proximity to power, how useful we can be to the Kaiser, how useful we can be to the Duke, how useful we can be to the King. But now that we're back in our own land, we have to think of ourselves as that power that's going to shine to the world. Uh, that doesn't mean through coercion. It means through creating a very specific kind of society, a type of civilization in our homeland that functions according to the divine ideal, not just in you know spiritual matters, but even in what we consider to be very political matters, how to run an economy. What does a Hebrew economy look like? What do minority rights look like in a Hebrew society? What does a healthcare system look like in a Hebrew society? Uh, wh wh how, you know, Shemitah, we're, we're about, you know, next year is Shemitah. We're going to have a Shemitah year, sabbatical year here in our country, like every seven years. Uh, is that just going to be about what fruits and vegetables we eat? Or are we going to have real conversations about the socioeconomic impact of the Shemitah year on our society? Can we alleviate debts? Should banks in our country be charging rebeat? Ultimately, our function is to create a society that functions so well that it inspires others to follow our example so we can be the conductor in that orchestra and turn the cacophony into a symphony. So my mom read an article somewhere about, uh, about the image of the Jew on television mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. especially as seen through Netflix. And you see that Netflix is not showing any longer the Jew that, that we used to be used to, like a, um, like a Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. The uh, nerd. Well, uh, yeah, kind of uh, uh, not, only just, not only just a nerd, but also a person with a lot of psychological uh, baggage, a lot of uh, pathos, um, anxiety, anxiety issues, and that kind of thing. And it may be also kind of a frustrated type of person, mm -hmm. uh, yet successful. Like, no, the, the, the Jew that's being visualized now on television is Fauda, 
which I think mm-hmm. in many ways has you know really shown Israel to both the Jew- to, to both the non-Jewish and the Arab. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can say the Western world and the Arab world as well. It's uh, Fado is one of the number one watched shows in the Arab world. Uh, mm-hmm. So th- that says something. And then you have like Shtisel, which is the ultra orthodox. So people are seeing first thing they're seeing a more Israeli Jew, mm-hmm. and and a, and a tougher Jew. So that's that's mm-hmm. you know a fighting Jew. That's one. And a more and a more observant Jew, not a secular Jew and an anxiety filled Jew. A, a Jew more th- connected to his own culture. That's right. His own identity. That's right. And, and less of a therefore less of a Jew that necessarily lives as part of an American or other society, but rather mm-hmm. as, a, as a Jew lives on his land, speaking a Hebrew language. These shows aren't in Hebrew, by the way, which I think is meaningful on its own, the fact that it's in mm-hmm. Hebrew. Uh, but another example is what we saw yesterday. So yesterday, the prime minister of Israel uh, spoke to the UN, to the mm-hmm. General Assembly, but he did it through a kind of studio here in Israel, mm-hmm. uh, which was, I thought, very well done in terms of the visuals. It was like two big screens, and he was standing in the middle in a black cut, a black kind of room with two uh, television screens. He, he looked nice. He looked like he was in good shape. And he spoke about um, he spoke about some of the dangers that Hezbollah, mm-hmm. uh, 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 the the dangers that it posits for Lebanon and not for uh, not for Israel. Mm-hmm. And so, it, and he showed exactly where the these missile depots are. And he also like threatened uh, you know Iran. He talked about fighting Iran. Uh, he talked about his partnership and his respect for President Trump, which has led to good things in his perspective, like and in my perspective as well, which is the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the recognition of the sovereignty of the Golan Heights, the uh, various uh, economic sanctions against Iran, and especially, I think he didn't mention the most important of all the successes, which is the recognition of uh, Israeli Jewish rights in Judea and Samaria, uh, and then finally, the Abraham Accords, which is a, a new regional, the beginnings of a new regional uh, relationship. Well, the world saw that. Uh, you know, it was it was broadcast all over the world, and people were watching that. Uh, and that, in in many ways, Netanyahu, with all of the flaws that he has and all the challenges that he has, you mentioned court cases and the corona. Uh, at the same time, he is a global leader, and his and his personage and his English, etc., is very much representative of Israel today on the global scale. Yeah, uh, he, Netanyahu, I think, certainly uh, appears to be a stronger leader internationally than he does domestically. I mean, he's perceived on the world stage as the leader of this small but strong uh, nation state um, that seems to be making giant leaps forward, you know, in, in terms of current events, what we see in the news, at least on the surface, it looks very promising that Israel is suddenly signing all these agreements with these other regional actors. Um, Hezbollah obviously is a powerful force and, uh, you know, and maybe threatening Lebanon. The truth is I didn't see the address. So uh, I'm interested to see it. I, I think I, I saw, I know of it. I think I, I saw people sharing it online. I didn't happen to watch it. But uh, I am interested in watching it with, you know, with that review you just gave. You know, you've definitely enticed me to go and watch what our prime minister has said. I think, you know, he he, he comes across as a, you know, he, or he's presenting himself very well as a as a strong Middle Eastern type leader. Uh, but he also represents a part of our society that is still what I would call, I, I would call it Yosef Wright. You know, I I think the real divisions in Israeli society are not so much between right wing and left wing or religious and secular. I I actually think those um, definitions are very foreign to our culture. Uh, I think that for us, you know, these ideas like religious and secular, that's a very Christian way of looking at things. I don't think the Jewish people historically have really looked at things in terms of religious and secular. And right and left, of course, is also uh, something we're importing from from the West. I think that the real differences in Israeli society are the different forces that exist within our nation. I think that you have the force of Yosef, which has been very dominant since the Zionist era, since the beginning of, of Zionism. Yosef represents the part of our collective identity that we share 
with the other nations of the world, uh, specifically the most dominant nations in the world in any given generation. Remember that Yosef himself, Yosef ben Yaakov, looked like an Egyptian. When Egypt was the superpower of the world, his brothers didn't even recognize him. He just like looked like an Egyptian. So Yosef is the part of Israeli identity, Jewish identity, Hebrew identity, that resembles the dominant powers of any given generation. And I think Yosef is also the force within our people that's most focused on the material well-being of Am Yisrael, meaning the uh, security, economy, high-tech, things like that. Whereas Yehuda, which is like almost like the opposite force, is one that uh, it focuses on what makes us unique, that represents what's different about the Jewish people, what we have to give to the world that the world doesn't already have, what's unique and different and separate about us. I think you see these differences play out throughout history in the time of the actual tribal heads, the sons of Yaakov Avinu, the sons of Israel. You see it in the time of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Remember, the kingdom of Judah was Judah, Levi, Shimon, and Benjamin, but the kingdom of Israel was mostly ruled by kings from the tribes of Yosef, from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, you see it in the time of Hanukkah, the, the time of the Maccabean revolt. The Mityavnim were a very extreme expression. The Hellenists were a very extreme expression of the Yosef force. And the Maccabeam were, of course, a very extreme expression of the Yehuda force. And we sometimes call that extreme expression of Yehuda, we call it Shimon, because remember that Shimon was kind of, you know, salted and peppered Yehuda. Right, Shimon was like the oh, oh, although although the Maccabees were uh, priests, they were from, Yeah, they're from from my tribe, and in fact, I come from the same family. I come from the same branch of the uh, of the Kohanim uh, as the as the Maccabees, and I live on the mountain. You used to live on the mountain, but I, I live on the mountain where which was the Maccabee headquarters for the first few years of the revolt. In fact, uh, Matityahu uh, Ben Yochanan uh, Alava Shalom left the world on that mountain and uh, it's not far from where Yudha Maccabi, his son, fell in battle. So it's also very inspiring, of course, to live in the Maccabean partisan camp. Uh, but the, getting back to the, the original point, I think that the real distinctions in Israeli society should be seen through the lens of Yudha and Yosef and then some of the other tribal identities as well. But the major players here are Yudha and Yosef. And I think that both Yudha and Yosef ha have a right-wing and left-wing expression meaning I would look at Prime Minister Netanyahu as what we, and, and not only Netanyahu, I'd say also Avigdor Lieberman, I would say Naftali Bennett, a lot of these political figures could be seen as right-wing Yosef, meaning they're still living the psychological paradigm of Western civilization. They're still looking at the world through that lens, uh, making decisions through those values, uh, but they just happen to be more, what we'll call like a conservative right. Whereas parties like the Meretz Party or or even certain people in Yeshatid could be seen as Yosef left, meaning a more, a more like the liberal Zionists. Like liberal Zionism can be seen as more of a less of a right wing expression of Yosef. Um, and I think that when it comes to Yuda, there's also a, a right and a left, meaning there is a Yuda that I would say it's probably best represented in Knesset by people like uh, Batella Smotrich, um, those who really are looking at the world through the psychological paradigm of Jewish history, of Torah, the words of our sages, the values of our prophets, you know, the mission of Israel. But I would say the right-wing expression of Yuda is one that focuses really on you know what's good for us what are our interests specifically the interests of the jewish people you know kind of almost like a narrow nationalism whereas the left-wing expression the more universalist expression of yuda which i think i consider myself to be a part of understands we obviously need to have a very strong and powerful national formation here uh, with sovereignty over our entire land and a very strong you know hebrew culture uh you know being expressed in our society but for the sake of the world and for the sake of actually being able to contribute to mankind and bringing the world, leading the world uh, somewhere better than it is right now. Very good. Uh, very good. Um, I was, I was just thinking about, um, about your, um, the way you laid out the political map. There's also the ultra Orthodox. And I just want to tell you about a, a little thing that happened the other day. Uh, as you know, uh, I used to live in the Mount of Olives like yourself for many years. And one of the things that my wife Malka loved so much on the Mount of Olives was the ability to stand on our porch and mm -hmm. to hear the slichot, mm -hmm. the prayers for forgiveness that Jews do 
in the month coming up to the high holidays, and then especially in the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And this year, because we are now in central Judea, in the heart of Judea, we are not exactly close to Jerusalem. We're about 20 minutes away. Um, we're watching it. Uh, excuse me. We, we were missing it. And, and this year, because of the lockdowns, there wasn't really a way to get there. But it turned out that we were watching Israeli news, Israeli TV, and suddenly a live program of the Slichot ceremony <clears throat> with the chief rabbis came online. It was a beautiful program, really well done, with also Israeli cultural cultural influences like Eti Ankri, who mm. was a secular singer and became a very uh, observant person and very spiritual person, and other people speaking about it. Then they got to the actual ceremony and now one of the main guys that was sitting in the on the it wasn't a dais because it was separated be, with these like plastic barriers for corona purposes but there was uh they did a ceremony before slichot which is called uh, uh which is called the tarat nedarim mm -hmm. and it was the chief rabbi of the kotel rav Rabinovich. the two chief rabbis the ashkenazi and Sephardi chief rabbis were sitting as like witness as judges mm -hmm. and one of the third judge the third judge was none other then minister uh, of the interior and a rabbi, a Sephardic rabbi, um, uh, what's his name? Derry. Arya Derry uh, was, uh, was the guy sitting there. And I was thinking to myself, wow, <clears throat> there's a guy who, and when he was interviewed, he, he like, they asked him political question. He's like, I'm not talking politics today. Today's a day of standing before God, the awe of God. I'm here to represent that. I'm not going to deal with politics. And I'll just tell you a little story about him. I, I used to not like him so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to think that he was corrupt and other things, but I, ha I got a chance to spend a day with him. And he did serve, to, to, just to make it clear, he did serve a prison, pr prison term for a while. But uh, this rabbi, Rabbi Arya Derry, I uh, and Knesset member and also minister of the interior, he was once in Hebron, and um, he was there during this exact period, about two years ago, during the ten days of repentance, and he was saying Kaddish, mm -hmm. for, uh, which is the, the the mourner's prayer for one of his parents, and he was praying the afternoon prayer in the Marat Machpelah, the tomb of the patriarchs and matriarchs, the tomb of the fathers and mothers in Hebron, Hebron. And somebody handed him a shofar in Mincha time to blow. But the shofar that they handed him was like a pistol of a shofar, a mm. tiny little, tiny, tiny little shofar. Now, everybody knows, anybody who's ever blown shofars knows that the tinier the shofar is, the harder it is to blow. Mm. And I was like, oh, man, this is such an embarrassing moment because they're handing him a tiny little shofar to blow. And he's in front of all of these people. What is he going to say? Oh, this is a bad show for, or is he going to blow it? And it's going to have these bad notes and it's going to sound all funny and silly. He took this little chauffeur, he nodded his head and he goes, Doo! and he let out such a toot out of this thing. It was like a war cry. I never heard such a thing. I was like, oh my God. And he hit it again and again and again. And I was like, oh my gosh, this guy has got in him this like warrior spirit. He seems very gentle. But he's got in him, and, and you said to me before the program, if there, if 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 politics was a sport, he would be a top athlete. Yeah. And my for point sure. is, is I didn't know exactly, you know, within your uh, constellation of of politics, where would you put this really rising uh, no, element, I, which is the ultra orthodox? I, I, I think they are a part of Yehuda. Maybe we can say Yisachar. Um, you know, we could say Yisachar as perhaps like focused on Torah in the narrow sense to the. To, to the exclusion of real life. I mean, to be really Yehuda, I mean, you have to be concerned with Torah and our culture and our identity, but to bring it into the world, to bring it into banking, to bring it into warfare, to bring it into politics and diplomacy and, and, and all of that, to sanctify the material, to, to reveal the spiritual in the material. And I think, the, look, the, the way I see the Haredi world... I'll try the next. Yeah, they are... Um, they're the fastest growing population between the river and the sea. Uh, I always say this, you know, I, I, when I speak to Palestinians, I always say this. I say that when we talk about solutions or we speak about where we're going to go together in this country, we have to take the demographic trajectory, the socio-political trajectory of this country into consideration and understand that Israel is a dynamic country. It changes. It's changed since its founding to today, and it's going to continue to change from today to, to where it's going. And the Haredi community, uh, as you 
quoted me as saying, not just Derry, I think a lot of the Haredi members of Knesset are some of the best athletes in our political systems. They're some of the most ferocious and cunning and skilled political operatives in our in our political system. Maybe the only the only one better is is our Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. But who who has been running who has been running with them? Yeah, for sure, uh, because they know the game. They, they, they play a game well together. They know how to play the game together. And and, and maybe the value system does meet up somewhere, right? There we are to definitely say, points of intersection. There, there's certain, uh, you you might call it you might call it conservatism. You might call it that. I'm not sure yeah. if they're cons. I I don't think the Haredim have a Western conservatism the way Netanyahu does. No, but but I, but, but, but I do think there are points values, of intersection. Right, there's right, overlap. There's certain values, there's right? That, that that they're like, right. okay, he's on our side in general speak. It, it, especially in certain in certain situations. And it, by the way, there are, keep keep in mind for the time being, the Haredi sector, the Haredi politicians are easier to appease for an Israeli prime minister than the national religious because the demands of the national religious community, especially those of us living and fighting for Jewish control over Judea and Samaria, are demands that often bring the prime minister and the state into conflict with the international community and with the United States. Right. Whereas the demands of the Haredi community rarely ever put the prime minister of Israel or the state in that position. So they're right. just easier, I mean, they're just easier to appease. It, I that's mean, a, that's usually, a great point. You made it, that's, that's an excellent, excellent and very true point. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another thing, which is they also share a certain philosophy. The mm -hmm. philosophy of Prime Minister Netanyahu, as I, as I sense it, I, I've never heard him articulate it, but as the way I perceive it, he says, Let's, let me not deal with the problems too much. Let mm -hmm. me more deal with our strengths and let us grow economically, which is what I'm good at, uh, diplomatically, which is what I'm good at. The internal deep state problems, I won't tackle them. The religious, the Temple Mount issues, the Judean Samaria issues, I really won't tackle them. I'll, I'll kind of freeze them or... Or not really deal with them. Let let things let the chips kind of fall where they may. But that's not my thing. I'm gonna grow what I know how to grow. And same thing with mm -hmm. the ultra orthodox. Just saying, we're not gonna deal with the problems of this country. Yeah, we'd like it to be more Jewish, the country itself. But we're not gonna really deal with it. We're not. We're just gonna stop backsliding. And in the meantime, we're also gonna support the growth of our institutions, mm -hmm. our children, our yeshivot, and we'll grow what we know how to grow. And let later generations for deal now. with it. In the meantime, for, we'll for be. Now. That, that's their attitude right now. But right. I'm not sure if that's always going to be their attitude, because I right. think at a certain point, the Haredim are going to wake up and realize how much power they really have. And to the extent to which the state is actually their state, it's not Poland, you know, where they're just kind of like hitching a ride and seeing how much money they can get for their institutions. This is actually their state They're, You know, at a certain point, they're going to be in a position to demand things like the defense ministry, the finance ministry, the foreign ministry. We're not so far away from the day where a guy like Ari Derry can say, you know, wait a minute, interior ministry has been great up till now, but I think I want to be defense minister or his successor, perhaps. It might be. Well, that we shall see. Well, we'll see right. about and, that because, but, but, because you have to. You have to kind of know something about defense to want the defense ministry. Okay, but but I think it is certain. First of all, I'm not actually so worried. Our, I think one of our best defense ministers to date was Moshe Ahrens, you know, who is not, uh, he wasn't coming from the general staff of the army. Uh, you know, uh, so, some of our best political operatives and some of our best ministers were not necessarily experts or coming from those fields until they came into that role. We have to take something else into consideration. The Haredim when they become conscious of their own power. I think a lot of the contradictions um, between them and politicians like Netanyahu will become more active. Right now, those contradictions are ignored. Like the, the points of disagreement between them and figures like Netanyahu are brushed to the side, as, as you said before. But when they become aware of their own power and their ability to really uh, have more hands on the steering wheel of where the state goes, I think those contradictions might become a lot more hostile uh, directly. And keep in mind also something else, that when they enter society, if you know this from those from the Haredi world who've come to serve in the army, who, who've entered the workforce, if you ever talk to these guys, you, you find their political positions are very, you know, what we'll call softly Kahanist. I think Kahanism is like nationalism for Haredim. That's essentially what it is. Even Rabbi Meir Kahana himself was well, coming. Can, from can you translate that into like like Anglo talk, like for that everybody, like my friends from let's say South Africa, can understand what you're saying? 
Well, I, I'm saying that there was a pol there is a political identity in the country uh, called Kahanism, which is often seen as just like the extreme, you know, the, the extreme nationalist, uh, you know, committed to Torah, committed to the land of Israel, very hostile to Palestinians. Um, but even their hostility to Palestinians, I would say, is more based on the fact that there is a conflict and less. Um, uh, Less a view, a, a negative view of Arabs. How do you say lechatchila in English? Uh, uh, from the get go, let's call it that. Right, meaning meaning if there was no like even the the most hardcore kahanist in Hebron, you know where you work, uh, if there was no conflict between us and the Palestinians, they wouldn't have a problem with them. The, it's certainly not a racial it. thing. It's right. It's not, not a racial thing. thing. It's based it's on the a... fact that there has been an ethnic conflict for a hundred years, and they right. take positions that are very much inspired by what they see our heroes in the Tanakh doing. Me meaning, the, the I think that's a big difference between Yosef, or in this case, Shimon. I think when we talk about kahanistim, we talk about Shimon versus you know, versus Yosef, I think in the Yehuda slash Shimon world, you know, when we look at some of our contemporary challenges, whether they be military challenges, diplomatic challenges, cultural challenges, you say, well, what would our heroes in the Tanakh do? What would, what, what's considered righteous behavior according to our ancestors and according to our prophets uh, versus the Yosef people, including Bibi and including Naftali Bennett, who say, well, what's considered politically correct in the world right now? Uh, politically correct for liberals or conservatives, meaning there might be things that are correct for politicians on the right versus correct for politicians on the left in, in certain places. So I think that this philosophy or this ideology, this political tendency known as Kahanism, uh, named after uh, Rav Meir Kahana, who had been a rabbi and a Knesset member, an activist and a Knesset member, even he came from a Haredi Torah background. He came from the Mir Yeshiva. He didn't go to Merkaz Arav. He didn't go to Haramor. He didn't learn in... Uh, national religious institutions. He learned in a Haredi institution in Brooklyn. That was his Torah. And he combined that Torah with a very Western nationalism, the nationalism of Jabotinsky, the Zionism of Jabotinsky, and that produced Kahanism. And I think when the Haredi world, we, you know, when they take their Torah, the Torah that they have, which is actually a much different type of Torah than the Torah that's taught in the Rav Cook institutions, like where I come from, places like, you know, Mahon Meir or Haramor or Merkaz Arav or the pre-army prep school in Eli, places like this. It's a different Torah that's being taught than the Torah in the Haredi world. And when that Haredi Torah meets real Just nationalism, I think it's going to result in a critical mass of Kahanistim in this country. And I think anyone who's looking to influence where this country goes, the direction this country goes in, needs to be conscious of that and needs to know how to create the conditions to guide that in a positive rather than a negative direction. That's very good. And I think the last thing that you just said is very important. But but before I get to that, just, just one, mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it correction, but clarification for people. Okay. When you say different Torah, we're talking about a different emphasis or a different philosophy, but the halacha, the, the Jewish law and the Jewish, and it's not like it's a physically different Torah. It's just a different spin on it, a different, a different, a different focus. A different, I, I would say a different level of understanding the Torah. Right. I, I, I mean, uh, in my, with, with, with all regarding, due respect, I would say a more... Uh, uh, a simpler understanding of the Torah. I said the Haredi world has a simpler understanding of the Torah, which is good. Simple is good for some people. Like, simple is not I'm bad. not sure I would agree with that, but I would just say less. it's definitely less nationalistic, and that's no, what you're really talking that. about. I think, I think less focus. It's not just that. I think the nationalism found in the Rav Kook world is actually an expression of a deeper understanding of Torah. I mean, but I don't the, think but, it's just but like the Torah out itself. Out the but the Torah itself is and, less And the meta-narrative. I, th I think there's a focus on the meta-narrative of the nation of Israel. I would actually say it like this. I would say after the fall of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. The, after the fall of what? I, I missed it. After the, after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, the this understanding of Torah, the approach to Torah that I think today is being taught in the Rav Kook world went underground. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai hid it in the Zohar Kadosh. I think it was uh, it was expounded upon by figures like Rabbi Yudha Levi, the Ramban, Nachmanides, uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramchal, the Maharal of Prague, the Gona Vilna, eventually Rav Kook. A and then I think when we came back to our land, it was really unpacked by Rav Kook. Uh, but it was only after the Six-Day War when the Jewish people returned to Jerusalem that it became accessible to the masses again, that it became widely accessible. But I do think it's a qualitatively 
different understanding of Torah, a deeper understanding, a true understanding, and of course the nationalism is one of many expressions of that true understanding. But the nationalism, of course, has to develop into universalism. I, I, I really respect what you're saying. At the same time, just because I'll give you an example for me, okay. as a um, consumer of media, I mm -hmm. listen to the ultra-Orthodox radio stations, mm -hmm. uh, especially Kol Chai, but, but I read the Sephardi one, which is called Kol Barama. Mm -hmm. And you compare that to the religious Zionist radio station, which is like Galei Israel, mm -hmm. you can't even compare it's, it's a totally different plane of a love and a depth of a connection for Torah. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the ultra-Orthodox world, their strength, let's just talk about strength instead of weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Their strength is a, is a focus and a fixation on the depth of Torah. And I hear rabbis speaking of Kol Barama with such beautiful depth, from Kabbalistic depth to, to, to mm -hmm. interpretation depth, halachic depth, and you just don't get that in the religious Zionist world on the, in the, in the, you know. At least in the, in the public face. You're talking the public face of the religious Zionist Well, world. let's, let's call it the mainstream of it. Yeah, so you know? Those who are, right, but I'm not talking about, maybe I'm not talking about the mainstream, because I would look at it like this. Religious Zionism was really an attempt to combine two isms, originally, meaning Rav Kook was never a religious Zionist. Uh, the, the people, I, I wouldn't call Haramor a religious Zionist institution, meaning the, Rav Kook was, was somebody who was a giant of Torah and a giant of Kabbalah and a student of 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 Rabbi Akiva. You know, remember it was Rabbi, look at it like this, Raman Yochanan ben Zakai, when we lost Jerusalem, took our entire civilization and made it portable. He took our entire way of life and turned it into this portable thing, which many centuries later became known as a religion. He, he went mobile. Right. Rabbi Akiva tried to reverse that right. in his time. Rabbi Akiva tried right. to reverse it and tried to bring it back to its full expression on a national level, rebuild the civilization, the Jerusalem, the temple, to have a, a kingdom again and, and to be able to like really be a player on the world stage. Rabbi Akiva didn't succeed. But Rav Kook did succeed in doing for the Torah, what Rabbi Kiva attempted to do. And that, and, and I wouldn't confuse that with religious Zionism. You know, um, religious Zionism ended up to be, like, in all fairness, what was called religious Zionism in this country, certainly before the Six Day War, was less, like, like what you're describing, less connected to Torah than the Haredi world and less nationalist than Mapai. Meaning, remember, in the Six Day War, when the cabinet was deciding whether or not to liberate Jerusalem from the Jordanians, the labor ministers were arguing for the liberation of the old city, and the religious Zionist ministers were arguing against. Right? That was that was what religious Zionism was until the Six Day War. But after the return of the children of Israel to Jerusalem, reality changed. It changed in many ways. There was a hashpa askulit. There was a, a metaphysical influence. You saw it with the Jews in the Soviet Union suddenly waking up and reconnecting to their identity. Jews in the United States suddenly being proud of who they were for the first time. And here, what we saw happen in, in the land of Israel was this bigger Torah, this Torah of our ancestors, the Torah that was hibernating from the time of Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came back to life and became accessible to the masses in many, 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 many institutions. I'm not saying everybody with a knitted kippah is a representative of that and probably pr probably less the ones who are allowed to have their own radio stations, but I think that there are certainly uh, institutions that uh, today we've created a, a vanguard um, I don't think it's complete. I think it's missing the third element, what I would call the universalism. But we've certainly created a religious nationalist vanguard that's arguably more connected to Torah or in a different way, maybe in a deeper way, connected to Torah than the Haredi world and certainly more nationalist than even Likud. Uh, it's a full expression of both. But it's not everybody with a, a knitted kippah. I think also that universalism is, uh, we have to start wrapping up, but I, I do want to no. say that the, the universalism, I think, has been opened up a little bit with these uh, Abraham Accords. I think the idea of the very name Abraham Accords speaks to that uh, uh, individualism of Israel, mm -hmm. but connecting with the other children of Abraham and the influence of Abraham. And I think that we are really are seeing, now it may be coming through economics and the Yosef kind of mm -hmm. uh, discourse, but it, it's leading and it's going to lead and it's and it's going to start knocking down, I think, the walls that have kept uh, Arabs and Jews apart um, 
through 100 we'll years see. of conflict. I, I, that's I that's my so. prediction. I that's my so. prediction. I, I, but, but like you said, right now it's being led by Yosef and being led by very kind of economic you know, considerations and security you know, considerations. I'd like to see it evolve to the point where the force of Yehuda and maybe in some cases even Shimon are leading our relationships with the Arab world. You know what? I, and I, I, I foresee that happening. And, and the vanguard that I exist in is on Twitter. And I've been finding mm. a lot of connections with Bahrainis, with mm -hmm. Saudis, with Emiratis. And they're not just talking about high tech and defense and all of that. They're talking about something more. It's mm -hmm. almost like the shell of, of, of prosperity is mm -hmm. leading towards, towards other intellectual avenues. Uh, I hope so. Yehuda Cohen. I, I hope so. Yeah. Let me ju let's just say hi to a few more people. We have here the Kumi Kumi Uri Farm says Shalom from Washington State. All right, that's really cool. What's, Wait, what's the Kumi, Kumi Uri here? I think Kumi Uri is next to Yitzar. Well, it's on the way. It's on the way. The Kumi Uri Farm from uh, Washington State. Uh, okay. We got another. Uh, we have here uh, Shalom from South Africa from Magdalen Magdalena. Uh -huh. We got our friend of ours Lee Fogel says two of my favorite Hebrews. I think he might be referring to me and you. That's our good friend Lee. Looking great. And I Hi, got Lee. here. All right. We got also uh, James says, Shalom from Manado, Indonesia. And Lou, my good friend, says, Netanyahu is perceived by most Western countries, but especially mm -hmm. by the Arab countries, as a great statesman. They may not necessarily agree with him on all issues, but he's considered a strong and a confident leader. Domestically, that's another story. So I think he's agreeing with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then Lee also threw in, Lechatchila, he says the, the proper Latin way of saying it is anti facto. Okay, I don't so know if that would have helped. Help. I don't know what that had clarified what I was trying to say. Yeah. But now, uh, listen, Yuda, I also want you to know uh, that today's show is brought to us. where We have a lot of sponsors of the show, uh -huh. and uh -oh. I just want to mention a few of them. One of them is blessedbyisrael.com. Uh, you got to get your Israeli olive oil. You got to get your Israeli jewelry or crafts or honey. It's a great time to get it. Oh, wine. They have wine. Wine is a different company. We'll see in a second. Oh, okay. That's blessedbyisrael.com. Coupon code Yisha. You get 12% off blessedbyisrael.com. The buy is B-U-I. And it's a mm -hmm. great way to not only support Israel and to fight BDS, but much more importantly is to have Israel in your bloodstream, in your house, in your life. So that's blessedbyisrael.com. Mm -hmm. uh, this show is always uh, posted by the good folks at jewishpress.com. One of the best Jewish and Israeli news sites, jewishpress.com. Uh, so thank you very much, Stephen, who's the editor there, jewishpress.com. We have a brand new uh, sponsor of the show, which is Natural Goodness from the Holy Land. And that's our good friend Simcha Gluck who, and Rachel Gluck, who puts out this amazing product called Salves of Jerusalem. How do you What's pronounce that? salves? I it's, don't know what it's, salve it's, it, it's like excellent creams, like muscle ache creams, a uh -huh. skin product. It's a beautiful website. So and a beautiful CBD? Product. Uh, no, no CBD yet, but I'm sure they're working on that. Uh, but but sure, why not? Natural goodness from the Holy Land, Salves of Jerusalem. They really make good stuff. I use it, uh, and and I really like it. It's also mm -hmm. it's it's just good for a lot of like whatever like issues you got on your body. You put some salve on it, 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 it kind of goes away. Everything is natural. Natural and organic. Natural mm -hmm. goodness from the Holy Land, Salves of Jerusalem. Our good friends at HebronFund.org. Uh, keep the uh, Jewish community of Hebron running, mm. and and that means that we continue to protect the tombs of the fathers and mothers, the patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Leah, and Rachel, not so far away uh, here in Bethlehem. And that's HebronFund.org. Really recommend that you come in, uh, support Hebron, keep it strong because it makes a huge difference for our whole nation spirit if our forefathers and mothers are in good stead. Uh, and then we also have. Our good friends at trelet.com, T E K H E L E T. I'm sure you're sporting your trelet right now. Am I right, Yehuda? You're wearing I some trelet? I am, of course. Of course you are. And here I am as well. Uh, and that is the true blue Jew string, the original mm -hmm. biblical blue. Uh, and that, if you go to coupon code Yisha, you get, I think, 5% off there, but get your own strings, especially your new talit for, um, uh, for the holidays. And you mentioned the wines. Yes, you're right, yeah. Yehuda. I know you're a big wine lover. That's our mm. friends at IsraelWines.com. IsraelWines.com, coupon code Yishai. Get 10% off uh, at Israel Wines. That's some of my, my, my sponsors of my show. And today, our guest has been Rabbi Yehuda Cohen. And you can read his amazing stuff and amazing writings at visionmovement.org. Well, well uh, the, the writings are at visionmag.org. 
visionmag.org, which is part of visionmovement.org. Am I right, right? Right, right, That's right. Absolutely. And Rabbi Yehuda, you're one of the leaders of the vision movement. You seek to identify and achieve the next step in Jewish history. You live Where are we in going North- next? Where are we going next? That's, where are that's we going we next? What, what are the next goals of Jewish history? How do we achieve them? And you also live in Northern Judea and lecture at the English Department of Machon Meir. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's just one last moment here. We're right as I look out my studio window here, I see my sukkah. It is mm-hmm. almost built. And I just want to give you a little, a little parable that I think you'll identify with, Rabbi Yehuda, which is an embassy can be used for many things. What do you usually use an embassy for? To just passport get your new – right, right. You, yeah, you get your passport. But sometimes when you're, in, when you're in deep trouble and you're running away from like that country that you're like – that you're like hosted in and you're, and you're being chased by the, by the, you know, by the, by the fetties and whatever it is. So you run to the embassy and you, and you flash your passport and you hope they let you in and they protect you. It didn't it's work for Jonathan Pollard. It didn't work for Pollard, sadly. Uh, but that, it should have worked. That's exactly yeah. – he went, he went the right direction. Uh, and the reason I say that is the sukkah that we have is like an embassy, embassy of the land of Israel, an embassy of, of God's embrace. And sometimes, like many years, it's just a great place to chill, to be filled with spirituality. When you're feeling so great, you just go into the, you go into the sukkah and you learn your Torah, you spend time with your kids, it's beautiful. But other times, like when there's a corona crisis out there, when politics is all uh, uh, adrift, and 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 battering, you know, the, the, the seas are, are battering the the ship. Sometimes you just jump into that sukkah as an embassy that defends you. Maybe that's the sukkah this year. What do you think about that? Sure, I think the sukkah is you know meant to provide divine protection. We build our clubhouses after the intensity of the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur season, right? We go out and we reconnect with nature. We build our clubhouses. And we live in those clubhouses and we enjoy we, with our families, with our friends, usually when it's not the corona period. And uh, yeah, and, and that is, of course, uh, more than symbolically uh, meant to teach us to trust in the Kadosh Baruch Hu and his divine protection as we dwell in our Sukkot, in our, how do you say, booths? What, what, what booths, they say? yeah, so they call it the booths, yeah. Right, like they in these like the little booth. kind of cl- clubhouses is probably better than, you know, all natural clubhouses, you know. <laughs> And we, I like and, I like to think of it as a nest, right? A place to learn. To, I, I'm really the truth is I'm really excited. I'm really excited to to do my podcast from the sukkah again, like last year, and to learn Torah again in the sukkah. Like I, I'm excited about the sukkah. I'm excited for the sukkah to sleep in the sukkah, to eat in the sukkah, to live in the sukkah. I even have a refrigerator in my sukkah. Wow. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Baruch Hashem, where we have like a pretty serious sukkah. It's almost it's like a real clubhouse, real like state of the art clubhouse. So you got a fat pad. Yes, I have a fat pad. Okay. <laughs> I'm one of those. Exactly. That is awesome. Yeah. Rabbi Yehuda Cohen, thank you so much for joining us, and thanks for being live with us and uh, taking all the time to, to set up and, and to spend some time with us here. And I hope that people play this uh, show uh, in their sukkah. And I want to really bless you with a, with a great year uh, filled Amen. with health. And also to you, to you, to your family, and to all of our comrades who are fighting to bring Am Yisrael closer to the redemption. All right, comrades, we're working towards the redemption. You, Rabbi Yehuda, thanks so much. God bless you, folks, wherever you are out there. Lots of love from the land of Israel. And what do we call it? We call it blessings. We say blessings. Blessings from the land of blessings. Do me a favor, folks. Write me an email, yishai at yishaifleischer.com or yishai at the land of Israel.com. That's the other sponsor we have for the show, which is the Land of Israel Network, an amazing network started uh, by uh, Rabbi Ari Bromwitz and Rabbi Jeremy Gimpel. That's the Land of Israel Network, landofisrael.com. Uh, and also check out yishaifleischer.com for all the other stuff, uh, all the other articles, uh, podcasts, videos, and things that are happening. And check out our sponsors as well. And check out our main sponsor. Our number one sponsor is God in Heaven, uh, the God of Israel, who is broadcasting 24-7. And all you have to do is tune in. So lots of love, folks, and shalom. <laughs>